Now, when we look at the, the Bible, Muslims are aware that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent many prophets, many messengers over time. And uh, these prophets and messengers all preached the message uh, of Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, we believe their word to be true and uh, the message they preached to be a message from Allah. We do not deny any of that. We recognize also that the message of these prophets over time were collected and transmitted by human beings who are prone to error. They might have written down things mistakenly. In fact, uh, over time, uh, as the word of Allah got transmitted from one person to another, from one generation to another, people added things, they deleted things, and they changed things here or there. Allah tells us in the glorious Quran that uh, people have uh, changed the book with their own hands. Woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say it is from Allah in order to profit a little thereby. Uh, so woe to them, curse be them for what they write and for what they earn thereby. So they have changed the book over time. The Bible itself bears witness that people have changed the book over time. Many of the quotations I will give you uh, will come from the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus and uh, Numbers. These are books which make up what is referred to as the Torah in the Bible. And they are said to be the books which were revealed to the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Yet uh, the Bible itself bears witness that the Torah has been corrupted over time. In the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 8, verse 8, it says, How can you say we are wise and we have the book of the Lord? Whereas, in fact, the lying pens of the scribes have falsified it. In other words, according to this passage in the Bible, the Bible is corrupt. More specifically, the Torah is corrupt. It has been changed around by the lying pens of the scribes. In fact, uh, it has become false. The lying pens of the scribes have falsified that book. Now, uh, when we uh, talk to people about Islam, often they will throw at you this point. They will say, well, what about women's rights in Islam? They say, well, women in Islam are subjugated. Their, inherent, uh, their inheritance is only half of the man. Uh, their witness is not uh, 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 quite as good as the man's. It is only worth half of the man's witness, and so on. So if you are equipped with uh, certain verses of the Bible, and you're speaking to people who believe in the Bible, or at least hold the Bible in some esteem, then you'll have the upper hand. Many people are unaware of what the Bible teaches regarding the status of women. And because they have uh, mostly grown up in Western societies, and they're familiar with the laws of the land here, they may think that uh, the norms in Western society actually is what the Bible is all about. Whereas, in fact, they may be surprised to find out that the Bible does not teach what they are now practicing and we have to draw their attention to that if they say well look you have a problem in Islam your religion cannot be true because women only inherit half as much uh, as their brothers well then what will they say about the Bible whereas in fact in the Bible in the book of Numbers Numbers chapter 27 verse number 8 uh, prescribes that in fact if uh, if a woman has brothers she doesn't inherit anything if a man dies leaving sons, the sons get all of the inheritance. The only case that a daughter can inherit is when the, the son does not exist. If she has brothers, the brothers get it, she gets nothing. Now many people will complain because in Islam, the sister gets half of what her brother gets. I'm just making the comparison very quickly to show that if somebody complains because the woman gets only half of what her brother gets in Islam, what is that person going to say when, according to the Bible, the sister gets nothing if she has brothers? Moreover, according to Numbers, chapter 36, verse number 6, 36, verse number 6, if a sister, a daughter, just inherits in this way because she has no brothers, she is then compelled to marry within the tribe. She cannot marry outside of the tribe because the idea is that if she were to marry outside of the tribe, she would then be taking her father's money and transferring it outside of the tribe and that is not right. The money of the tribe should remain within the tribe and therefore if she inherits in this way, if she had no brothers and therefore she inherits, she has to marry within the tribe. 
Now, people complain because the witness of the woman in Islam, they say, is worth only half the witness of the man. Now, that's not correctly stated. The witness of a woman in Islam is not half of the witness of the man. And that, again, is not my topic to explain it, but I'm just trying to now make the comparison. But what would those people think if they read the Bible and they realize that the witness of the woman can be entirely cancelled by the witness of men? Or the vow of a woman can be entirely cancelled by the statement of her father or by her husband. We read, for example, in the book of Numbers in chapter 30, verse 6, that if a woman makes a vow while she is still under her father's authority, uh, then her father can cancel that vow when he hears about it. And in the same chapter, the book of Numbers, chapter 30, verse number 14, we read that when the woman is under the authority of her husband, uh, that is when she is in her husband's house, if she makes a vow, as soon as the husband hears about it, the same day he can cancel that vow or he can leave it to stand. Now, of course, if a woman has to live by these rules, it will become impossible for a woman to conduct business uh, because nobody would want to deal with her. If she makes a deal with you, if she makes an agreement with you, her father can break that agreement or her husband can break that agreement, depending on who, in whose house she happens to be living in at the time. Now, friends, I do not say any of these things in order to condemn the Bible. I do not say any of these things to disagree with the teachings that is there in the Bible. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told Muslims, لا تصدقوا أهل الكتاب ولا تكذبوهم ولكن قولوا آمنا بالله وما أنزل to the end of the ayah. He said, do not confirm what the people of the book say and do not, dis or do not disbelieve what the people of the book say or deny what the people of the book say. Neither affirm nor deny what the people of the book say. But instead, you should say, we believe in Allah and what has been revealed. What has been revealed to all of his prophets. So if this is a revelation from Allah, we believe in it. If it is not a revelation from Allah, why should we believe in it? I'm not saying these things to condemn the Bible, but only to point out that when people condemn the Quran, when they condemn the laws of Islam, and when they try to pick holes in the religion of Muslims, they often do this being unfamiliar with their own books. And what Muslims should do is to have this information ready so that you can help these people to be familiar with their own books and then they will not have a chance to speak ill of the religion of God or about the book of God. Now, I mentioned briefly about the fact that it's not correct to say that the witness of the woman is worth only half of the man because that's not entirely true. In fact, uh, in the Quran we have an occasion which shows us that a woman's witness can actually cancel the witness of a man. The occasion is described in Surah Nur, Surah 24 in the Quran. In the opening verses, it tells us there that if a man were to accuse his wife of adultery, then he has to come forward with four witnesses. Now, if he does not have four witnesses, he himself will bear evidence five times. As if to say, one each for each of the four missing witnesses, and then fifthly, on his own behalf. Each of these five times, he is to bring down the curse of Allah upon himself, if indeed he is lying. Then, the woman is to give evidence. But she is only to say that her husband is lying, and she is to also give evidence five times, in, in reply to his five testimonies. And each time she's to say, well, she's bringing down the anger of Allah upon herself if her husband is telling the truth. Now notice, she doesn't have to say, I am innocent. She doesn't have to say, I did nothing wrong. All she has to say is, my husband is not telling the truth. If he's telling the truth, the anger of Allah be upon me. Now after having done that, if she has done that, well then, the whole thing that one evidence cancels the other, the judge cannot decide, and all he can say is that this family has to part. Because they cannot live together under this accusation that is still there. Let this family go their own separate ways, but the woman is not declared guilty. In other words, the woman is presumed innocent until she can be proven guilty. The man is made to first bring his evidence. He is first made to bring the curse of Allah upon himself if he is telling a lie. 
And only after he has done that is the woman brought forth to defend herself. But first, the accusation has to be made, and the man who makes the accusation has to come forward uh, with his witnesses. Now, if anyone, according to this same surah, were to, were to imprecate women uh, falsely, women who are known to be chaste, and he cannot bring his witnesses forward, then such a man is to be flogged 80 lashes. So there is not just a matter of making an accusation, but uh, one has to be very clear about what one is doing because there is a consequence for giving a false testimony and bringing false evidence against, uh, or false accusations against uh, a chaste woman. Now in comparison to that, uh, we find that in the Bible, in the book of Numbers, in chapter 5, verses number 11 to 31, that is the book of Numbers, chapter 5, verses number 11 to 31, we find there described what a husband should do if he has a feeling of jealousy concerning his wife. Whether she has done wrong or hasn't done wrong, whether she is guilty or not, but if the husband has a feeling of jealousy concerning her, what is he to do? He's to take her to the high priest. And then the priest will make her go through this, what is called a trial by ordeal. He will give her some bitter water to drink, which is mixed with the dust from the altar floor. And then he's to write some curses on paper that you're going to drink this water. And if you are guilty, then, you know, let this water, uh, let the curse of this water overtake you so that your belly swells and your thighs waste away. But if you're innocent, may you be saved from the curse of this bitter water. Then he's to wash off that writing, the ink from that writing, and let that mix with the water, and then give that to the woman to drink. So the idea is that the woman is presumed to be guilty until she can be proven innocent. If she drinks this water, and nothing happens to her over time, then it is assumed that, okay, she was innocent, because the curse didn't take effect. But if she was guilty, then you would expect her belly will swell up and her thighs will waste away. When she's brought into the court of the high priest, and the, the priest is saying all these curses, you know, if you're guilty, your belly will swell and your thighs will waste away, it says in this chapter, in the book of Numbers, chapter 5, that the woman is to say, Amen, Amen. So the only thing apparently that she says is, Amen, Amen, and there's nothing else recorded from her that she says. But what if the testimony of the husband is, is wrong? What if his jealousy has no basis? It says at, in the last verse of this chapter, in verse number 31, that uh, in fact uh, the, the woman, if she is guilty, she will have these effects on her, but uh, there shall be no guilt upon the husband. So he just comes in, he brings the woman forward, he makes his accusation, the woman goes through this trial by ordeal, and uh, he goes scot-free, apparently, from all that we can tell from this chapter. And it is curious to notice also in this chapter that when the woman comes forward to go through this trial, the priest uh, takes off her hijab. And uh, it, it seems a little bit curious that this is done, and it's a little bit shameful, according to the Bible, it is shameful for a woman to take off her head covering. So it looks like from beginning to end, the woman goes through this shameful routine, whereas in fact she might have been innocent, but she's presumed guilty until she can be proven innocent. Now in the same vein of discussing the evidence of a woman and how she's presumed guilty before she's proven innocent, in the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses number 13 to 21, we have there described what should happen uh, in the case of a man who marries a woman, then he sleeps with her, and then he says, well, she wasn't a virgin. I married her thinking her to be a virgin, but she wasn't a virgin. So what do you do then? It says that the father of the girl should come forward to the priests at the city gate, or the elders at the city gate, and then he is to present to these elders the evidence of the girl's virginity. Now, you might be wondering, you know, what, what's, what's this evidence? Many years ago, many years ago, when I was learning Spanish in, in uh, elementary, was, was it high school? Yeah, when I was learning Spanish in high school in Guyana, I remember the, um, the Spanish teacher was explaining to us about a custom 
that uh, is being followed in, uh, I think he said it was Spain, but I don't remember. It was something to do with our reading assignment for that time, and he was explaining the, the traditions that people followed that gave rise to the description in our reading assignment. And he said that what happens there is that you know, the, the bedding from the wedding night is kept, and that is a proof of the girl's virginity. So apparently what is being described here in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 22 is that the father keeps that bedding from the wedding night. And if the girl is accused by her husband that, look, th this girl is not a virgin, was not a virgin when I married her, the father is to take that cloth and present it to the elders of the city gate, and that proves that she is a virgin and that she used to be a virgin. However, what is interesting to notice here is that if the father doesn't have that cloth, if he's unable to present that proof of his daughter's virginity at the time of marriage, then it is presumed that the girl had committed adultery prior to her marriage, and hence she should be stoned to death. I wonder how, uh, how, how this actually worked out in practice. Perhaps this was never acted upon, Allah alone knows. But to act upon this really seems a little bit uh, strange. Not only in our modern times, but if you think of the practical dynamics of it, uh, not, uh, not in every case is the bedding uh, soiled uh, through that activity. Anyway, I must move on then. But uh, the, the point there is that she is presumed to be guilty until she can be proven innocent. And if she doesn't have that required proof, she will be killed. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse number 28. Deuteronomy ch chapter 22, verse number 28, and describes what should happen in the case of the rape of an unmarried girl. You know, she was married, that's a different matter. But if she was unmarried, what should happen? If she was unmarried, then the man who committed this rape should pay 50 shekels as a fine. The 50 shekels goes to the girl's father. So he pays the 50 shekels to the girl's father. And then he's to take this girl to be his wife. And it says in the Bible, in these same passages, well, in, in the verses surrounding this, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse number 28 and forward, that he's not allowed to divorce her for the rest of his life. So he has to keep this girl. But that's looking at it from one point of view. But what about from the girl's point of view? Much of the Bible is written not from woman's point of view at all. In fact, it, the woman it does not seem to be considered much of the time. Because if you ask a girl, do you want to marry the man who raped you? <laughs> she might say, no, I don't want to marry this rapist. Uh, why do I want to marry the man who, in fact, hurt me in the first place? But uh, according to this instruction, the girl is to remain married to him. And while it is true that he is not allowed to divorce her, in fact, a Jewish woman could not be divorced uh, by her own initiative. According to the Bible, the divorce is issued by the husband, and it does not go the other way around. It is interesting to notice that the 50 shekels, which is paid as a fine, is paid not to the woman who suffered the damage, but it is paid to her father. Because it is considered that the girl is her father's property, so to speak. And the man who violated her violated the man's property, and therefore he pays uh, the money to the man. Previously, we just finished describing uh, what happens in the case of the girl who had been um, uh, uh, accused of not being a virgin. If that accusation was found to be false, in other words, the proof of the virginity was presented by her father, then obviously her husband has given a false testimony and accused her of something which is not true. So what is his penalty in that case? According to the Bible, in those same verses, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 13 to 21, uh, this man is to be fined a hundred shekels, but he gives that to the girl's father. Again, the girl's father gets the money, and the girl suffers the shame and uh, the accusation and the slandering of character. Now, all of this is in the Old Testament. And uh, my friends might be saying to me, well, Shabir, well, that's the Old Testament, but, you know, I believe in the New Testament. So I'd like to say a few things. First... The New Testament confirms that the Old Testament law is still valid. In the book of Matthew, in chapter 5, verses number 17 to 20, uh, Jesus, on whom be peace, is quoted as having said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. 
I've come not to abolish but to fulfill. Therefore, whoever will keep the smallest one of these commandments and teach others to do the same will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever will break the smallest one of these commandments and teach others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So according to this passage, every commandment from the Old Testament is equally valid in the New, unless we can say, unless Jesus on whom be peace specifically abrogated or canceled any one of these particular laws. But in general, they are still available and still valid. Second, we should be aware that the New Testament carries forward and continues some of the same principles from the Old Testament. For example, in uh, 1 Corinthians, in chapter 14, verse number 33. We have here an instruction that women are not allowed to speak in church. That in church they must remain silent and under complete subjection. But why? You might ask, ask why this particular instruction? Well, that is explained in 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 11. In 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 11, it is explained that the woman is to remain silent in church and be under complete subjection and under control and that she has no authority to teach men. The reason given there is that when the devil deceived man as a result of which we're all here and we're all under sin, it was not the man himself who was deceived but it was the woman who was deceived. You see, the book of Genesis in the Bible, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, tells us that after God created man and woman and instructed them not to go near that tree, the devil came to the woman and deceived her. And then she gave the fruit to her husband, and that's why he ate it. So when God came and said to him, Adam, so you ate from the tree, he said, the woman you gave here to be with me, she gave me the fruit, and that's how come I ate it. So then God put a curse on the woman that from now on you will have to bear children in pain. For this reason, when anesthetics was invented, the church said that anesthetics cannot be used for a woman during childbirth. They said for a reason. They said that God's curse is on the woman that she should bear children in pain. And if you now apply anesthetics, you're going contrary to the wish of God. God wants her to be in pain and you're trying to make things easy for her. But they said that anesthetics can be used for men. For example, if a man is having his tooth extracted, you can use the anesthetics. Why? They said that when God created uh, Eve from Adam, God first put Adam salam, to sleep and then took out his rib to make the woman. So we have a precedent already. God did it first. First he put the man to sleep and then he did the operation. So it's okay to use the anesthetics, put the man to sleep, and then take out his tooth. But if the woman is having a baby, let her be in pain. That's God's wish. Now the idea is that uh, in the New Testament, we have repeated the same uh, theme from the old, that the woman was the one who was deceived, but the man was not deceived. And therefore the woman then should be kept under subjection and complete control, because if you let her, look what she did to the first human being and to the rest of us by implication. Now, some may be wondering, what about the covering of the head? In, uh, back in November last year, I delivered a talk in Leeds in the United Kingdom and uh, there after the talk, one of the Muslim brothers said to me, you know Brother Shabir, after what you've explained today, you know a lot of things make sense. He said, you know, a lot of times people come and they ask us questions and we didn't even understand the question so how can we give the right answer? He said, when people ask about this hijab thing, why do Muslim women cover their heads? And they think that this is a sign of subjection of women. Where did they get this idea from? That it is a sign of subjection of women. In fact, the hijab in Islam has nothing to do with subjection of women at all. It has to do with different reasons. But it is in the Bible that the hijab or the covering of a woman is said to be a sign of subjection. This particularly is described in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11 uh, verses number 3 to 12. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses number 3 to 12. There it is said that the head of every woman is her husband and the head of a man is Christ and the head of Christ is God. Now it is a different thing here to notice that Christ is under God but notice also that the man is under Christ and the woman is under 
the man. So if you have a ladder, a chain of beings, you have God on top and you have the woman down below at the bottom. This chapter also explains in these verses that the woman is the image and glory of the man. But the man is the image and glory of God. So the man shouldn't keep a sign over his head because he is the image of God. But the woman should keep a sign of authority on her head because she is the glory of the man. So she should have a sign on her head to show that she is under subjection. Moreover, this passage says that she should also cover her head because of the angels. And, and many people wonder, what is meant by the angels here? Why does she have to cover her head because of the angels? Some Bible commentaries explain the reason for this. In the Bible also, in the book of Genesis, in chapter 6, it says that the sons of God, meaning the angels, looked down upon earth and they saw the women, and they fell in love with them, so they came down and took these women to wives, and uh, as a result were born the giants of old time. So what is being hinted at in this passage is that the women should cover themselves, otherwise they might tempt the angels from above. This is what some of the Bible commentaries uh, say is the reason that angels are mentioned here. But I think what is more important is to notice, for our present purposes, the idea that the hijab or the covering of a woman is the sign that she is under subjection. That comes not from the Quran, not from Islam, but it comes from the Bible. Now I'd like to end this talk by giving you one last uh, Bible reference. I think that's uh, enough for one day, right? <laughs> that's, uh, that's appetizing or what? <laughs> appetizing, yeah? <laughs> to use your terminology, yeah? Okay, it's going to be too full. Uh, if I give you too much, it might uh, eventually be, you know, too much icing on the cake. No good for you. Okay, in Revelation chapter 14, the book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible. Book of Revelation chapter 14, verses number 1 to 5. In verses number 1 to 5 here, it is described that there will be 144,000 people in heaven. Now, it is questioned whether it is meant 144 literally or whether this is a symbolic number, meaning a lot, much larger number, but only 144,000 is mentioned here. Jehovah's Witnesses think that it is an actual number. 144, those are the people who will go to heaven. The rest of the people, if you are good, you will resurrect, you will live right here on earth, but your Jannah will be right here. You live here forever, but this will be it. But the 144,000, they say, these are the only ones who will go to paradise. But who are these 144? How can we describe them? This chapter describes them in verses number 1 to 5. In verse number 4 in particular, it says, These are ones who have not been defiled by women, but they are virgins. Which means, to be that, you have to be a male priest who doesn't get married. And in fact, some of the Bible commentaries, looking at this passage and noticing in modern times that this doesn't fit in with anything that we believe today, they say, well, some of the monks may have written that passage there in the Bible. <laughs> but it is still there. It is there, Revelation chapter 14, verses number 1 to 5, saying that these people who will go to heaven, they are those who have not been defiled by women. I should explain this word defiled because some of you are speaking English as a second language, right? Defiled means made impure. So these are those who have not been made impure by women, but in fact they are virgins. So it would mean that even these priests we read about uh, recently in the papers, I mean these ones who were uh, said to have uh, been contracting the AIDS virus in America, that uh, perhaps uh, they too don't qualify because I guess they are no longer virgins, right? Or how do you qualify that? Now, to bring my talk to a close then, in summary, what I've tried to show in this talk very quickly is, is not that the Bible is wrong. I haven't tried to show that. I haven't tried to criticize the Bible or to offend the faith or belief of anyone. I've tried to speak honestly, frankly, and clearly about some very important issues. Muslims sitting in this room have heard for far too long accusations and uh, innuendos and all kinds of things against their religion. They've heard all the negative stereotypes. It's always reported in the news. It's always in the papers. Everyone is saying things. Uh, but Muslims often do not know how to reply. And I've given you some bits that you can use in replying to at least those people 
who hold the Bible in high regard. Look, if they think the Bible is good, they cannot come out and criticize Islam for these things which they traditionally criticized Islam about. Because if they say, look, in Islam the woman gets only half the inheritance that her brother gets, look, according to the Bible, the woman doesn't get any if her brothers exist. And even if her brothers do not exist, and she does now get something, she cannot marry outside of the tribe, she has a restriction, she has to keep the money inside. Moreover, uh, we have seen that people criticize Islam saying that, look, in Islam the evidence of the woman is only worth half of the man. Whereas we have seen in the Bible that the evidence of the woman, in fact the vow of the woman, can be cancelled by the vow or her, of her father or by the words of her father or the words of her husband. We have seen that in fact in the Quran, a woman's testimony can overcome a man's testimony. And the woman is presumed to be innocent until she is proven guilty. And if anyone accuses her falsely of anything unchaste, that man would be flogged 80 lashes. So there is a penalty. Uh, by comparison, we have seen that according to the book of Numbers, the woman is presumed to be guilty until proven innocent. She goes through a, sh a shameful ordeal in order to prove herself innocent. Uh, but uh, we wonder why this uh, detail, uh, why these detailed ordeal, whereas the woman should be presumed innocent from the start. We have seen that, uh, in fact, to continue that, there are numerous other passages in the Bible which continues to presume that the woman is guilty until she's proven innocent. If a husband accuses his wife that she was not a virgin when I married her, the evidence for her virginity has to be presented. If that is not available, the woman is going to be killed presuming that she had committed adultery before her marriage or fornication. We have seen also that uh, when a woman is raped, as a consequence, she has to live with the man who raped her, and the penalty for the rape, the fine that is given, is given not to her. In fact, in Islam, a woman's property is hers, hers to keep. Her money given to her at the time of marriage is hers to keep. It is her own property. It doesn't go to her father. Now, some people may say that all of that is from the Old Testament, but look, I believe in the New. But I've shown also that the New Testament continues many of the themes from the Old. In fact, that the New Testament says that a woman must be silent. She cannot speak in church, but she must remain quiet. And if she needs to know anything, she should ask her husband at home. Why all these instructions? Because it is said in the New Testament that the woman is the one who caused sin to enter the world. She was the one who was deceived by the devil, but the devil did not deceive Adam, but deceived her. And then, of course, she gave the fruit to her husband. We have seen also that the woman, according to the New Testament, must cover her head. She must wear a veil over herself. Why? Uh, so that she must be, she must prove that she has an authority above her. The husband is an authority above her, so she keeps that head covering as a sign of subjection. So where does the idea that the hijab is a sign of subjection come from? It comes from the Bible. We have seen also that uh, from the Bible, and the, the, if, uh, there is a passage which, curiously enough, will not be believed in by many practicing Christians today, but it is still there in the Bible. It says that a woman, uh, well, by implication, that a woman does not go to heaven. Only 144,000 people will go to heaven, and they are all male virgins. In summary, then, we can say that if we have this information, and we are equipped, we are ready to defend the faith of Islam, then we're ready not only to defend the faith of Islam, but to help other people to see the truth of Islam so that they might accept that and they might also be saved by the mercy and grace of Allah.